And our final speaker this afternoon, last but by no means least, is my colleague Ruth Hanafy. You've all been in contact with Ruth over the past couple of weeks as she's been working all hours to put this symposium together. Um, but she has also been getting some field work done and has been working with a colleague or a volunteer, very good volunteer of ours, Mark, um, to look to test some of the the measures that we've just heard about, um, deterrence, sonic and smells and all kinds of things in the field, which is a very difficult task. And Ruth is going to present the results of that experience now. <laughs> thank you, Kate. And thank you, everyone and everyone who's still with us online. I hope you're having a great day. I find it fascinating. It's just been brilliant to celebrate, but also talk about the the difficulties of working with pine martens and I probably could have just called this talk tri tribulations and left out the rest of the words which is no surprise to most people and Anya included. So what is a deterrent? Um, I think a lot of people would have heard of acoustic deterrence perhaps perhaps in the case of marine mammals but we are looking at and when I say acoustic I'm, I'm generally referring to ultrasonic deterrence and some of these ultrasonic deterrents also have flashing lights um, there are noise deterrents and, and onions mentioned these and these do seem effective putting a radio up into an attic and just that noise and talk radio where the animal will hopefully believe it's it's somebody up there and then foul smelling deterrents um, like this one up here so essentially a harmless method of discouraging the animal not harming it but keeping it and sending it away on its way but there are issues with these kind of things as we've just heard habituation we need to see if the animal just gets used to them as, as we would if we really wanted something over there and there was a particularly bad smell you just go for it and know that you won't be stuck with it so there's a lot of things that go into testing how these kind of deterrents work so why do we need them well we want to stop animals the pine martens and getting into these spaces before it's before we have to go to the measures that on yet discussed and it's really helpful to talk after these last two speakers because what we're trying to do to turns is stop getting to this point altogether for all of the reasons for the people for the pine martens and in particular in some cases for the kits so for example this is um, a kit outside or a pine martin outside a front door of a house but this is a video in an attic space and um, you can see the kits there and you can hear them and they're tiny absolutely tiny so the issue there is for the householder, for the ranger trying to find them, um, it's, it's next to impossible. So there is a real risk to, to kids like this, that, that if, if we didn't know they were there, how would we know? And then they would perish. So to stop them at this before they can get to this point where they do give birth um, in the attic space. So why else do we need deterrence? Yes, this um, is from last September. It's a radio or it's a, a a news article that's based on a radio show. So somebody called into the Joe Duffy show because a Pine Martin had done countless amounts of damage to their car in Sligo. Now, the real is issue is that the insurance company classed it as vermin, so wouldn't insure. But this was part of the radio show and, and did become really one sided, as often these shows do. Um, and also we have, have other cases of pine martens taking birds kept by people in their gardens or kept by people like this man with hens and partridges. So there are real issues out there for people. And we've, we've talked about physical barriers. So what we, at feed, so this is a, an interesting one. Um, can you see? And that video is the reason that we changed our guidance document to say four centimeters is the, the distance for a pine button, the space a pine button can get through. We'd previously said 4.5 centimeters, but when you see this, you realize it has no trouble just squeezing through this four centimeter gap. This householder loved them and had no problem with it eating the food for his birds, but it, it was really useful for us to see this. So the kind of things um, Kate and I and VWT do is we test methods so that we can find ways that are harmless to the animal, but keep the animal out of places and stop this kind of interaction with humans. Again, this householder loves Pine Martins. We were worried that we might deter his, his, his favorite visitors, but we, we put on this bin strap and you know the, the joy that is trail camera technology. Let us see if it worked. And I won't ruin the surprise, but the, all of these kind of videos are available on our website for people. And I do have some of these bin straps with me for any of the, the rangers or people here who'd like to see them and think they'd be useful. And this did work, but it, it did try, try very hard to get in. So that's essentially what we try and do, find the issues, find cost-effective solutions, see if they work. 
pray to God that they do, and then when they do, roll them out so that people can use them themselves. So that bootstrap did work, thankfully. <laughs> Physical barriers, as we've mentioned, come in the form of, of wire, proper, proper um, wire and electrified netting. So these are with Kilcormac Sporting Conservation Club, not too far away, and we have a long running history with Kilcormac and then with the so National Association of Regional Game Councils to trial this um, kind of lower cost method of keeping martens out of um, out of these um, pens for game birds as part of this gun club, and then this electrified netting system here. So there's a huge amount of work again gone into this area of physical barriers. And then you all heard Dr. John and Elle's fantastic talk this morning. Um, so we ran, um, so for the organizer, we, we co-ran a, a conflict resolution workshop in Clara Bog in 2017. And John and Elle came over and he, he really is fantastic in, in this field of conflict management and we had the, um, NARGC, we had pest control, we had people keeping organic poultry, we had a lot of the rangers, I remember Anya spoke as well there, and we talked about what the situation is with, with pine martens. And as has come up today, there was a lack of habitat, and there is still a lack of habitat, um, a lack of information also, and then VWT were identified as key people to, to move forward in providing this information. So because of that, um, we, we highlighted a lot of the different issues. It's very complex, as we've heard today. They're a fascinating animal, a complex animal, and the issue is complex. And there are so many different facets to it. And one of them, which I'll mention, is partnership. So uh, Dr. Jenny McPherson, who you heard from um, with her, her previous comment, came over and we co-ran a workshop with MPWS Rangers, and we, we put together a flowchart um, as a collaboration of how to manage the situation of Pine Martins getting into houses, giving birth to kits, and the timelines and everything we go about there. So it really has been a, a long um, growth period to where we are today and, and will continue. So the need for information um, out of that, pinemartin.ie was born, and this is again a collaboration between VWT and NPWS, and this is a national resource for the Pine Martin in Ireland. And after much brainstorming and after the conflict resolution workshop, it was identified that it needed to meet the needs of four user groups. Can you just see? And these are journalists, gun clubs and poultry keepers, foresters and farmers, and householders. And I won't go too much into that, but it's just to highlight it's, 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 um, its position there for, for anyone who's not familiar and wants to find all of the information, all of the research papers, all of the guidance, we all put it in this one place for people to access. And some of it is des designed for householders and it includes the video which Anya mentioned, which is advising people to check their houses for gaps now, or it would have been a month ago, so at the key period, to stop the female from getting in, finding that perfectly suitable denning site, which um, which is available and, and so that people can block up those access points and just prevent us getting to some of the case studies we've looked at, as well as with case studies from conservation rangers and a lot of other information out there. So to get on to the deterrent trial, now these, these products are both um, from Germany, so they may well be, be designed for stone martens, which is something I should say before talking about them. So one of the... the high points, I suppose, of me listening to the entire episode on the radio in September um, was that a gentleman came on from a hardware store and mentioned that he sold a product which was a deterrent for Pine Martins. So I promptly tracked him down, phoned him up, called him and ordered some. And this is it here. It's a scent deterrent. And for many years, um, since before 2020, as you can see there, we've been trialing some ultrasonic deterrents, both in the UK and here. And this one we particularly settled on because it was the strongest one. It's a pole deterrent. It gives out a high frequency sound that um, I noted that I could hear it when I started working on them a few years ago. I was a bit bothered that I didn't hear it a few weeks ago in the field. <laughs> Let's hope that was just my hearing on the day and not my aging process. Um, so this ultrasonic deterrent has been given to some rangers dealing with issues like a pine martin attached roof, for example. But it's really not possible to tell the cause and effect, you know, if, if there is any really real benefit or any real effect from the deterrent without doing it in a systematic setting in, in a proper setup trial. So this is what we set out to do. Um, and this, this is the study design. So um, the study design would have involved a pre-bait period until the pine martens are seen to come and, and take the bait and we know they're in the area. Then we would have a control period for six weeks and then we would put out our two different deterrents. These would be put out at two independent sites 
to keep them independent, they're about a kilometre apart, so we know that it's not just the same animal going back and forth. And we would be testing these against a fully controlled site with no intervention using a deterrent. So this is the kind of long-term study we are planning. Um, so what I've been doing for the last few weeks with Mark, one of our fantastic volunteers, is testing whether these deterrents work and whether they warrant a long-term study or whether we need to look at other methods. So our study location is here. Um, on the shores of Loch Mask, absolutely beautiful. And it's a really useful study site because all those blue dots are from the 2019 and 2021 Mustela survey, where we had another fantastic volunteer, Brian Hughes, doing his MSc, and we've repeated the survey again in 2021, and we have a huge amount of trail camera footage. Now, this study was aimed at the Irish Stoat, but we picked up a lot of Pine Martin um, footage and we know that they're there and we know what kind of density they're there because this was one of the survey sites I did as part of the Pine Martin population assessment in 2017 which Denise O'Meara and Kira is involved in too. Um, Denise O'Meara mentioned in her talk earlier so we have a good idea of Pine Martin density in the area. So our study sites involved um, a pre-bait setup and this is what we did, um, three, three cameras, and the reason for three is we're trying to design a future trial, and we wanted to put the scent one here, so we needed to be able to see Pine Martin reaction from any direction, because in theory the scent would waft in any direction and have an effect, so we wanted to, to see what the kind of, how many cameras we would need to, to run it effectively. And this is, we put down a, a locked open cage, um, which was camouflaged, and inside we had our bait, which is two eggs in this case. So this was our first site, the woodland site. And then over a kilometre away, we have the canal site. This one is going to be directional because we're going to use the ultrasonic turret here. And we have three cameras and our cage trap here. So beautiful sites, great Pine Martin habitat. So we put out our cameras and then we went back to check them. And we saw that we were recording Pine Martin, which is great. But they weren't really that bothered by the cage, they weren't bothered by the bait, they weren't really interacting at all. So it was fine, we kept going. Um, still no interest in the eggs um, or the, the cages as time went on. So in collaboration with, and here we go, one just ran across the wall there at speed but hasn't gone anywhere near the cage. So we spoke to our colleagues um, in the UK, Patrick and Jenny, and he advised, and Jenny suggested valerian. So I found my nearest botanical uh, shop in Galway, bought some valerian, made great use of Jake Lutz, which have really helped me out in the last few weeks, and we put some valerian into the, the cages. Um, and this made all the difference. The Martins were showing a lot of interest in the cages, which is fantastic. So now we had a, we had a proper trial on our hands. We were seeing how they were before we put in any intervention. So this was our first deterrent, the scented one, again with the Jake Lutz, and um, this went out at that woodland site. Uh, sorry, I'll just go back there a second. So you can see there the cage, we put the, the scent right over it with a little bit of a, a waterproof covering. Um, Kate described it perfectly as kind of chemically, a chemically sickly sweet smell. So it didn't smell foul to me, but you know, it's advertised for this purpose, it's sold for this purpose, so we hope that that's exactly what it would do. So here it is with the three cameras. And then at the other side, which is, which is our directional site, we set up the deterrent. Now we started with it over here, and then after a week or so, we moved it here. So you can see it's within two meters of the cage. And we had seen that the Pine Martins were coming from this direction, so we had sussed out where they would be, where we were likely to blast them with some ultrasonic high-pitched sound and see them run away while winking at the camera and giving me all the data I needed to talk to you today about how brilliant it was and what fantastic scientists we were out in the field. And then wildlife decided to be wildlife and not follow my, not read the memo either. So this is the ultrasonic deterrent. So they do they have it at kind of head height, so it's a little bit above that, in case that might be any of the issues. It's not. <laughs> There's been little or no, well, little, no reaction whatsoever except to, to climb up on it. Okay, I was suitably despondent after that, so we went over to the woodland site, perhaps our, our scent, which, which would be better because it's a, a cheaper deterrent and something quite useful for a householder and, and perhaps something people could use effectively. Could be used? No. And this was a day later, so it would still have been fresh scent. It's very hot weather, but it wouldn't have all evaporated the day after. 
And then just in case we put some more on, add another look. See. So, <laughs> we need to rebrand the word deterrent, clearly. So that is where we are at the moment. And that is why when I have listed in the agenda deterrent uh, demonstration, I envisage both of them working and us rolling out that big long trial in, in Ireland with rangers at different sites. So we would have a really fundamental system and systematic trial, but we're not there yet. So I think we need to go to our, our toilet blocks, our lavender and our other, and our other uh, methods. So what are the other methods? Are there other methods? Well, there are other smelly objects um, this is one my colleague Tom has because they've been working a lot in the Forest of Dean with bat roosts and pine martens. So this sm apparently smells of dog hair, but there was one review on Amazon that was, it was in German, but I could read straight away that it was, no. So, but we'll see, it'll be worth a try. Um, there are other ultrasound deterrents that have flashing lights. Perhaps that's something that would be enough to, to just give a quick shock factor. I know Dave had some success with those in Wales. Um, but I'm really paying attention to the work of Suzanne and Eva in Germany, and it has come back to using electrified wiring. So our goal at BWT is a long-term study so that we can find um, and write up and really prove the use of, of deterrence for householders, for rangers, for anybody coming into contact with the species that would need it. But at the moment, it's still a work in progress. And, and I guess that's, that's science for you. But it's been good to talk about today and to show you, because it, a lot of the, the deterrent work done on mammals appears to be in a captive bred setting. So it definitely poses challenges doing it in the wild. So it's been interesting to get over those for the last few weeks and see how we're getting on. But it's something that it will be a work in progress and, and hopefully at some point in the future, I'll be reaching out to you asking if you'd like to be involved in running a, a long term trial of, of a deterrent that we can then put in place and recommend on pinemartin.ie. So that is all from me for now. Um, and there's my details. So I'll just leave those up and happily take any questions anybody might have. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ruth. We're, we're back on track time-wise, <laughs> so it was deliberate ploy that the deterrent work didn't, didn't work. Exactly. So any questions from the floor, please? There's one at the back. You, would you? Sorry, the gentleman's name, I don't know it, it yet. Des. 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 Oh, sorry. Hello. Oh, yeah. okay, good. I'd just like to ask about, um, you keep, one keeps being asked about uh, pine mark versus mink in mm. terms of attacks on poultry particularly how do you differentiate and how do you decide which it is we get that question a lot on email in person or via email and people you know, sometimes send me a photograph and, and say this is a photograph and this is the puncture wound which animal is it and the truth is i don't know um i would imagine that when when vets are, are analyzing they will look at the the intracanine distance between the two but I, I personally don't know whether there will be, you know, I would imagine there's variation in the age of animals, how their, their skulls will, will, there will be overlap. Um, so from my, my personal experience, it's not something we can tell from just going out and looking afterwards. And I don't think we know enough about the behaviour and the predation behaviour of the two mustelids to be able to differentiate. Now I would welcome um, another view from anyone on the floor that, that knows of evidence and how we can tell that. But from my point of view, it's not something we can really categorically state without, without looking in. And that's where trail cameras really are unbeatable in, in showing what's been there and exactly what occurred. Because some of these animals as well will take carrion, which is always worth bearing in mind when you do find something that's been killed. But um, anyone else? It, it's something worth discussing with the vet, I'd imagine. But. Um, and it's, as well as that, it, it's what you're looking for when, when, when vets are analysing, you know, are they, are they going with, with the two intercanine distances of the two species and then the age ranges and how they could vary. So I, I don't think that will give us an answer. Anybody else? That's a good question. There are questions from online? Yeah, Cardiff? yeah. There's a couple of questions here about the deterrent. So one from Emma saying, does the ultrasonic device have any effect on dogs? 
Really good question. We did have a lady using it in Strand Hill and she had um, small children visiting and dogs and I was worried because it was in her back garden and it didn't seem to have any effect on them. But what Mark and I have done is the, the ultrasonic deterrent comes with three settings for different sizes of animals and different types of animals and we've been going through the settings this week just to see. Now it's had no effect on Pine Martins which setting but we've definitely noticed a difference in the number of there's a lot of sheep, there's a lot of deer, there are foxes moving through the area and we've noticed differences in how they are visiting the site which is interesting and something worth noting but but um, because it's they're not our target species we haven't we haven't really drilled into it yet so it doesn't seem to have an effect on dogs in in this lady's back garden but it seems to have an effect based on some size of animals when we've gone through the three different settings mm. which i think leads me on to the second question okay. from jenny uh, can you adjust the frequency that the device is emitting you can you can adjust it, it, it because it's from the continent it's it's aimed at um at, it looks like there's one aimed at stork and one aimed at deer and some aimed at badger and raccoon so we've been going through those in case they're relevant but um and i would imagine that change that the it says that the they're at 13.5 to 23.5 kilohertz and i would imagine it's just going through that depending on on the signs for these species so you can do and it does say it works to eight meters and it says it has 110 um degree effect but we haven't found those but again it is designed for stone martin maybe that's where the difference is um yeah question from the floor ross hi great talk i really enjoyed that um is there any a known reason why valerian isn't attractant oh a very good question it's it's strong smelling for sure um it's i i wouldn't be able to say it was it was jenny that had come across it and we in in scotland we've used pine martin lure which is horrendous smelling i remember getting on a camera bag and weeks later going oh god this and it's it's really unpleasant um valerian is, is not unpleasant and people obviously use it in tea but it's 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 got some sort of a mild foul smell in it whether it's just part of that same family of smells um so i don't know why that is it was really interesting to come across yeah so i'm not sure what it is about it um and it, it was interesting when when um suzanne even mentioned lavender because maybe it is something like that but but what mark and i we often sit in sight and discuss these things and we really can't see how a scent would be enough to have any long-term effect but perhaps but it seems unlikely that something wouldn't just push through a scent and and put up with it for a short term period and maybe get used to it. Yeah. Any more questions from the floor? Anything more online? No? No. Okay. 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 Thank you. I'll just well, um, before I hand yeah. over to Kate for the, the, the wrap up of the day. Um, I just want to say a, a huge thank you to everyone who's come. A massive thank you to my webinar, um, Martin and Evan. Martin, it's been a, a joy to deal with these last few weeks. And um, and also the, the fantastic chairs, um, Ferdia, Hugh and Kate. I hope I haven't said anything you were just about to say, but just a big thank you. <laughs> Typical, she's always <laughs> doing this. <laughs> thank you. They've been so good to deal with, so thank you. And I'll hand over to Kate. And um, for people coming tomorrow, I'll see you at, at 9.30.